right, everybody, settle down, settle down. We have a crisis on our hands, people. I need you focused and ready to pitch me your best ideas. Seems kids nowadays aren't interested in Saturday morning cartoons no more and instead want to spend all day playing on their Nintendos. Those snots are our primary demographic and we need them watching our shows so that we can sell them on those sweet, sugary cereal ads that provide us with our paychecks. What if we make shows about the video games they're playing? That might draw them back to our programming. Hmm, I like it, I like it. Now I'm a jaded old businessman who doesn't have time to play video games all day, so help me out here. What popular games would translate well to our particular medium? What about Super Mario? Super Mario, no. Already taken. Luigi. What about Donkey Kong? No, we won't do that one yet, but maybe someday, when the world is ready. I'd shower you with coconut cream pies. What about Pole Position? <coughs> you guys know Pole Position, right? It's this game about- Now, now, son, no need to explain. I know all about Pole Positions. What? What? Sir, it's a racing game? <clears throat> I, uh, I knew that. Anyways, kids like race cars and they like video games, so why not give it a shot? I suppose it is better than nothing. Yes! You won't regret this, sir. Say, do you think now would be a good time to discuss that raise I've been asking for? I'll start paying you more when you finally make me the catchiest cartoon intro of all time. But until then, you should be happy that I pay you at all. Now get back to work. Catchiest intro of all time, huh? Challenge accepted. That raise will be mine. From now on, like your parents were, you are the secret force of pole position. The position! Watch me hurt! With an intro like that, there shouldn't be any confusion as to the show we're watching today. It's... An 80s cartoon based off a classic arcade racer of the same name. The show begins by quickly introducing us to our two main characters, Tess and Dan Darrett. Two legendary stunt drivers who are busy entertaining a crowd of onlookers, racing fanatics, and two guys who probably aren't evil or anything like that. It's also important to note that Tess and Dan come from a long lineage of stunt drivers, though both of their parents died in some fiery crash or something many years before the show takes place. I don't really know what happened, the show doesn't really delve into it that much, so your guess is as good as mine. Both Tess and Dan have high-tech supercars that come fully equipped with these creepy autopilot computers that talk to them throughout the stunt show and offer them assistance when necessary. Must go faster. Kind of like Kit from Knight Rider, or some weird twisted inside out Thomas the Tank Engine situation. I apologize for putting that image in your head. Anyways, the two computers are named Wheels and Rody, with the former being voiced by one of the guys from The Temptations. Sure, why not? I'm not really, really sure my hydrofoil is working very well. You're such a worrier, Wheels. Everything will be fine. This first sequence is actually pretty cool and features Tess and Dan racing through giant hamster tubes and on water and stuff. I'm sure I would have been all over this when I was a kid, since I loved race cars and Hot Wheels and all that jazz. Honestly, if NASCAR races had huge pipe mazes for the racers to navigate through instead of these circuits where the drivers make a hundred left turns, I'm sure there'd be a lot more people interested in the sport. This scene also establishes that Dan is a total wimp and probably shouldn't be driving a high-speed race car. Dan, what are you doing? Listening to Rody's stupid joke. Why? You're hydrofoil, Dan. You're hydrofoil. Rody, the water. Quick, go to Hydra. Rody! Rody, will you please get us out of here? Seriously, is it his first day on the track or something? Cause this guy's probably gonna die in front of a whole crowd of people. Have a nice swim, Dan. Everybody's a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> Dan.
Dan apparently doesn't think he deserves to be teased, but this guy's a total moron. A moment later, he just gives up mid-stun and forces Rhodey to take over for him. Whoa! Rhodey, take over! I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Hey, that was no sweat, huh, Rhodey? real professional. Anyone in this crowd is probably more qualified to drive a stunt car than this dolt. Or maybe he should just leave the autopilot on all the time, since he obviously didn't inherit the same stunt driving genes his sister did. Way to go, Wheels! Right on, Rhodey! Oh. Will... Holy f***! A little warning next time showed Jesus. Well, if that jump scare didn't make it obvious enough, Blondie here is this episode's villain. Way to go, Dan! We're in a level 3 emergency, Dan. We'd better contact Dr. Zachary immediately. Level 3? Oh no, I didn't realize it was that important. Let's move it! Oh, Dan, you big lovable doofus, you. Excuse me, uh, do you think a world-class stunt driver would have time for dinner tonight? Well, how about it? Dinner tonight? Greg Dumont, what are you doing here? What I'm doing here is asking you out on a date. Well, I'd love to, Greg, but, oh, something's come up and... Well, how about it? Dinner tonight? You know, just gotta attend to this level 3 emergency and all. Dinner tonight? Haha, <laughs> sure, now really gotta get going, saving the world and stuff. Well, how about it? Pole position two to pole position one. Dan, Tess, it appears as if someone has tapped into our computer system and stolen the command codes to the pole position cars. Right about now, you're probably asking yourself, who is this irrationally beautiful man? This happens to be Tess, Dan, and Daisy's uncle, Dr. Zachary, who has called the siblings together to discuss a level 3 emergency. He explains that someone has hacked into their computer system and stolen the command codes to the cars, which gives anyone complete control over the cars and the pole position computer system as a whole. He instructs Tess to change the command codes to prevent their important data and whatnot from falling into the wrong hands, but good old Greg happens to be listening in on the whole conversation, the slimy little creep. Dinner tonight, dinner tonight, tonight, dinner tonight. Later, Dan is busy working on his ride, and he notices the evil Leland Palmer look-alike from earlier hiding amongst the tire towers. But instead of confronting the suspicious figure with a well-mannered, Hey man, this is private property, get lost! He just continues to go about his business and pretends he didn't see the guy at all. Classic Dan. Ouch! Don't look, but there's somebody spying on us. I said don't look! I don't see anybody. Telling you there was somebody there. Well, there's nobody there now, so just relax. Just relax. Hey, where are you going? I'm going to dinner with Greg Dumont. I'll see you later. Greg Dumont. Big deal. Big deal. Meanwhile, Daisy is trying to fill the void left by her deceased parents by dressing up Wheels and Rhodey in their clothes. Uh, yeah. I'm no psychiatrist, but I think Daisy should see one. Wheels, you'll be mommy. Oh, Wheels, don't you look gorgeous? Wheels seems a little too into the whole roleplay thing. <laughs> <laughs> Time for bed, Daisy. Aw, oh, gee, do I have to? Yes, you have to. Oh, and Daisy, please stop stealing Mom and Dad's clothes from the cemetery. It's really becoming a hassle to return these outfits to their graves every night. I'd really appreciate it if you could stop doing this. All right, good night. Well, of course, Daisy doesn't go to sleep like Dan instructed, but honestly, who would take anything he says seriously? Rhodey, take over! Instead, she sneaks out into the garage to sleep inside wheels. Ugh, this is getting weird. I guess Dan has insomnia or something because he's just wandering around the racetrack late at night, but he does happen across Evil McTrenchcoat discussing his sinister plans of destroying pole position with none other than Greg Dumont. Dinner tonight? Ah! Dan, what are you doing out here? I just saw your friend Greg Dumont talking with the same guy that was spying on us before. 
Oh, come on, Dan. You're acting silly. Yeah, Dan. Just relax. Anyways, Greg snoops around and manages to override the command code for wheels, giving him complete control over the car. Though he did not expect to find Daisy sleeping in the back seat. She doesn't seem to be too happy to be woken up at this hour and gives him this psychotic stare. Yeah, she probably needs help. Greg is unfazed by the demon child and continues on with his mission to steal wheels. Since now he has Daisy as an added bonus, he decides to use her as leverage so that he can escape. Tell that other car I've got the little girl. Rhodey, he's got the new command code. I can't stop him. Rhodey, what happened? Greg Dumont, he's stolen the wheel that... Tess, he's got Greg Daisy. Dumont? I just can't believe he'd steal wheels and take Daisy with him. I don't know what to say. I do. Let's go. More words of wisdom from the scholarly Dan Darrett, ladies and gentlemen. While Tess and Dan set off to save their kidnapped sister, Daisy gives Greg Dumont a piece of her mind using The Power of Sex. You're a bad guy, aren't ya? That's a matter of opinion. Well, you stole wheels and kidnapped me, so it's my opinion that you're a bad guy. I second your opinion, Daisy. Then it's settled. You're a bad guy, and someone ought to tell your mother. Not gonna lie, if I was robbing a bank or something and a little girl came up to me and said something like this, I'd probably drop the act right there and rethink my life choices. I mean, she has truly mastered the art of the guilt trip. Brody, take over! Dan devises some idiotic plan to save Daisy, which I assume would have involved him jumping from the roof of one moving vehicle to another. I say I assume because believe it or not, we never actually see what Dan intended to do since he messes everything up again. Yeah! Brody, would you please put a seatbelt on my brother? At least everyone still supports Dan. What are you doing? What is he doing? Your brother is crazy. It runs in the family. <laughs> okay, well, maybe not. Oh. Poor Dan, his genius was wasted in his time. I guess Greg eventually gets sick of Daisy and her power sex, and therefore maroons her at some rest stop, but she is quickly captured again, only this time it's by Vance and his high-tech helicopter. Dan, I'm starting to think that Daisy's parents should have named her Peach, since she has an uncanny knack for getting captured. And as to be expected by this point, Dan attempts to play the hero again, this time pulling a Captain America. Since he has the arm strength of a soggy ramen noodle, he ends up getting an aerial tour of the surrounding forest instead. Because pole position as a show is supposedly all about the stunts, we do get a short stunt sequence in which Tess somehow drives up a rock cliff to avoid a speeding semi, and Dan on the other hand somehow manages to fall from a helicopter into a moving car without breaking his tailbone. Finally a win for Dan I guess? How are we gonna find Daisy? Dumont's the key. I got a feeling he'll lead us right to Daisy. I'm not sure I can keep a radar fix on him once we get into the city. With or without radar, nobody loses me. <laughs> Did his voice just crack? With or without radar. The gang take their street chase into a busy city, which any action movie director could tell you is the ideal setting for more cool car stunts. After almost giving this poor trolley driver a heart attack, the two cars careen down an alleyway, narrowly avoiding this garbage truck. And let me just say, this garbage man missed his calling as a dancer because his moves are fabulous. The chase continues into the subway system, giving the adrenaline junkies a chance to convert their cars into hover mode for more over-the-top stunt action. This feature also helps the drivers miss being obliterated by a train, though with Dan at the wheel, I'm surprised he didn't freak out like he did earlier and manage to kill everyone with his ineptitude. You're starting to get the hang of things, Dan, but I'm starting to wonder why Tess let you take over in the first place, considering she's definitely a better driver than you are. Turns out the fake wall behind this hippo here leads to Vance's secret lair beneath the city. And much like Greg Dumont, Vance is starting to realize that capturing a sassy little girl is probably a bad idea. Why are you a turkey? Why are you a turkey? Daisy! Don't come any closer. 
Dumont, get the other module and place them both in the computer terminal. Dinner tonight? Stop fooling around and bring me those modules! Looks like Daisy caught the dancing bug too. She and that garbage man should start their own dancing troupe. Greg, how could you do this? You wouldn't understand. Now how about dinner tonight? Vance decides that now's a great time to monologue about his evil plans of destroying pole position and Dr. Zachary's career. But then suddenly, the dashing Dr. Zachary shows up on a computer screen to reveal that Greg Dumont was actually a pole position agent the entire time, secretly working under Dr. Z's supervision to sabotage Vance's own computer systems. This struggle would later become known as the Great Computer Wars of 1984, and can still be found in some history textbooks today. It's not over yet. I still have the child. It's too late, Vance. Your computers will blow in 60 seconds. Let her go, Vance! Dan! Ted! Be quiet! Daisy, run to the computer terminal, quickly! Which button do I press? Press them all! <laughs> Oh man, this makes me laugh every time I see it. It's just another great example of that iconic Dan logic. I mean, if a computer system is rigged to explode, is it really a great idea to just aimlessly push every button in sight? Seems like a recipe for disaster to me, with Dan as our dim-witted head chef. Press them all! With Daisy rescued and Wheels and Rhodey secured, our heroes are able to escape just as the computer systems blow out behind them in a glorious spectacle of lightning and smoke. Vance makes a daring escape of his own, but is quickly apprehended by some local dance cops. You mean to tell me Dr. Zachary planned the whole thing? Well, with the exception of Daisy getting involved, he planned everything. I guess that means your dating me was also part of the plan. I tried to tell you, Tess, but I just couldn't. I really care for you, and that wasn't part of the plan. Yeah, I think he's gonna kiss her. That's affirmative. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, Dan, no need to turn into his psycho just because your sister is getting some action and you aren't. But seriously, whoever animated this should be fired because this laugh is downright terrifying. <laughs> and so this episode concludes with Tess and Greg finally getting some alone time after one heck of a first date and their passion is so strong that it causes a traffic jam, several injuries, and the first purge. All told, I had a lot of fun with this one, and hopefully it comes across that way in this video. Sure, the show's cheesy, and it could practically be sold on the shelves of your local grocery store next to the craft singles, but it's that decadent kind of cheesiness that makes this show so enjoyable to the point of being almost endearing. The characters are all pretty goofy, especially Dan, but the awkward line delivery paired with some hilariously bad writing makes for some truly memorable moments that I won't be forgetting anytime soon. Press them all! While this cartoon may be based on a dead and frankly mediocre video game franchise, I'd say that this show provides enough quirkiness and oddly comedic moments to make it worth watching. It's far from a great show, but I'd be interested just to see what other weird antics the Derrett siblings get up to. I mean, looking at the episode plot synopses on iTunes has me somewhat intrigued, since one is about a prize chicken while another involves a magician? Who knows, maybe I'll check out these episodes in the future. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's episode of Saturdays. I hope you guys enjoyed this look at the 80s classic, Pole Position. Please feel free to leave your thoughts on this show in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe for more overly critical looks at kids' cartoons. I've been your host, Max, and thanks for letting me be a part of your weekend. Right now I'm feeling an unexplainable rush of adrenaline to go out and perform some sick street stunts like my heroes Dan and Tess, so if you don't hear from me in a while, it's safe to assume that I was probably hospitalized for incorrectly timing a jump over a semi-truck while cruising at 100 miles per hour. See you guys next time.